I couldn't help but notice that you've clicked on and are presently listening to an episode of the Paranormal Patio Podcast. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your support. And if you want to continue to support us, the best thing you can do is share our episodes on social media. That's right. You can tag us in everything. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find us on ParanormalPatio.com, where you'll find articles, links to information from our past guests, as well as, uh, you know, every episode as it comes out. Also, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash beyond the patio. You can get a monthly live stream, at least one, sometimes we do more, exclusive bonus content, early access to all of our episodes, and starting with season three, I've got to move season one to the archives. So, they'll be on Patreon as well, and you can listen to them there. Thanks again for your support, and uh, hey, let's get into the episode. What kind of weird thing are we talking about today? Well, for the next 50 minutes, the paranormal patio can be located directly behind the farm, because tonight, host of the farm podcast, recluse himself, Steven Snyder. I've got to hang out with Steven in real life a couple of times, and I'm going to cherish those conversations for a long time. Steven's show and his books focus more on the parapolitical side of, I don't know, it's sort of like an adjacency, I think, to what we are going to talk about tonight. And I think you'll understand, I think he even expresses, you know, like how they're tied together. While not an extreme fascination of mine, I do enjoy listening to it, for sure. You get a lot of it with the farm. But the farm has also got some, you know, the side-by-side paranormal stuff. And it's, it's uh, good. And, it, and it's a great show. And Steven's a great host. And a pretty cool person to hang out with, too. A few announcements uh, for this episode. Not related to the episode, but I've recently appeared on Conspiro Normal, episode 401. So, you can check that out. So, if you and Adam are both great. I've also just appeared on Penny Royal Season 2, As Below. I believe it's episode 8. So, catch those. Um, and I will be appearing in Steven Snyder's podcast the farm for a subscriber episode so join up over with the farm and support steven and the project and uh had a really interesting conversation i think you'll enjoy that too in the meantime let's focus on paranormal patio that's what you clicked on anyway might as well just listen to it and carry on and go about your business and do everything you want to do just in the paranormal You're listening to the Paranormal Patio Podcast. patio as always yeah it's me jason still here joined in the paranormal patio by someone who i got to hang out with in somerset and uh actually met back in nashville back in september at the strange realities conference steven snyder welcome to the patio oh thank you for having me on sir it's been a pleasure um we've been chatting a little bit and also while we were in somerset we ended up finding out that we were uh, hotel neighbors <laughs> right next yeah, door. Yeah, it was an odd kind of synchronicity. We found it out, like, what, on the last day we were there and saw that we'd actually had uh, hotel rooms like, right next to each other the entire time. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? Yeah, yeah. I guess, it, did you stay at the hotels at the Strange Realities Conference at the one place they got? No, I stayed, like, outside of town in this really shady hotel that had a liquor store in it. Um, oh, okay, okay. It was, like, okay. part of a trailer park. I don't know, it was weird, but it seemed like it might be one of those weird liminal places, and I was hoping to have something weird happen. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, it'd be fitting for us, you know, attending Strange Realities Conference, so... Right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it worked out fine, nothing happened, and it was actually, like... Without incident. I mean, it was just a really shady little hotel. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, Somerset. Kind of, uh, spaces, so, oh, yeah, for know. sure. For sure. Somerset was a much nicer hotel experience, I must say. Yes, no, no. I mean, especially for the price, that was uh, definitely money well spent. Absolutely. It's Somerset's not big, right, anyway, but it was in a good spot. I mean, there's, 
you know, stores and restaurants all over right there, right on the main mm, drag. Yeah, and, on the bike walking distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nothing's far. I mean, it's like a two minute drive to the Paranormal Museum from our friend Cal Cadell, and you know, the pretty much equidistant to the uh, Jarfly Brewing where the party was. So it was a good time. Did you have a good time down there? I did. I did. I'm baffled though at the lack of um you know ubers or taxi cabs they have because I, I believe it you know makes a good amount of uh revenue off of like uh tourists you know from like cincinnati and what have you coming down there for the lake in the summer so you would think you know to, to discourage drunk driving and so forth they would have a couple of taxis or something like that but um uh, yeah it was uh yeah it was anyway we ended up getting a ride home with you actually i remember that um yeah, yeah. which was a good thing because i was rolling at the time so, um. <laughs> i was not i was being responsible i did not want to get an out-of-state dui the first thing i asked kyle was like hey man is there an Uber service here or Lyft or something? He's like, uh, well, at Jarfly, there's a sign on the door that says you can use the app or just call me. But he's usually pretty busy unless you book it up ahead. And I'm like, well, shit, I guess I'll just, you know, only drink water. And so I had... Yeah, no, I was just like, what, what the heck is this? There's, there's no cabs. There's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, yes, Somerset's not, uh, you know, it's not D.C. or New York or something. But I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, some tiny little podunk town either. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I mean, it does have like a bit of a tourist economy and what have you. You would think they would have something. Man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I had a beer, uh, drank water the rest of the night, got to hang out with, uh, hang out with you a little while, day. Dan Dutton, got to meet Dan this time down. Of course, the Penny Royal guys, uh, Adam and Serfiel from Conspiracy Normal and uh, Kevin and Jessica from Beyond Sight. So, Josh Van Hook. It was like an all-star lineup down there at this release party. It was such a great time. Yeah, no, it was uh, definitely a lot of fun. I'm looking forward uh, to the Strange Realities Con, too, in uh, October. And uh, obviously, uh, I'm going to be doing a bit of traveling in the intern as well. So uh, it's always fun, uh, all the people I've gotten to uh, meet from doing this. Uh, it's definitely one of the uh, most fulfilling aspects of all this. And um, I'm very blessed to be able to uh, you know, now have the opportunity to uh, go around uh, the country and see all you guys. Yeah, it's definitely my favorite part like it's really cool when you stumble across something like research wise or whatever that blows your mind and leads you down a rabbit hole but at the end of the day the people that you meet along the way like definitely far and beyond outshines anything that you like learn or pick up because some of the people that i've met have just been the absolute best people mm -hmm. yeah absolutely do you remember my ridiculous shoes that i wore to the party Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those shoes were great, man. I mean, those are <laughs> fucking coolest shoes ever. Every person was blown away when they would ask me where I got them. And I said, I got them on Amazon for $40. And they're like, oh, my God, why doesn't everybody have these? I said, because <laughs> only I can pull this off. It was ridiculous and fun and stupid. And it was everything I hoped it would be. You were my hero on a lot of levels, man, because those shoes were great while I was rolling, too. I mean, to kind of Oh, yeah, I on. bet. Just give me the, the ride home, man. I mean, <laughs> back to the hotel, just like God. <laughs> well, you know, really deep down, that's why I wore my thought. Maybe Stephen would be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I was, uh, was going to be doing that MDMA, so you wanted to accommodate me. Like, uh, that's very uh, magnanimous of you, Jason. <laughs> it's what I do, man. It's what I do. I live to help. That's, that's really all I have. Anyway, all, all that aside, we had a really great time. Um, it was good to... Hang out with everybody down there. Of course, I you know, stay in contact with a lot of a lot of the Somerset folks anyway. But getting to spend time physically with people uh, is something that we need. You know, we've been all locked away for so long now. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously, you know, I mean, it's not like you find uh, tons of people out there who have the uh, same kind of interests a lot of us do as well. So. Yeah, I just kind of feel like those encounters are more sort of the uh, types of places where you can let your hair down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, and wear ridiculous shoes and and that just, too, that too. <laughs> be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, what have you brought to the paranormal patio to share with all of my listeners? But first, actually, before we get into it. Tell everyone a little bit about you, what you do, and uh, you know, because maybe some of my folks haven't even heard of you yet so all right well uh a lot of people know me online as a uh, recluse i got into uh blogging 
Uh, I guess it's been over 10 years. Yeah, yeah, it was 2010. Uh, ironically, I actually had uh, started out um, as a ghost hunter. Uh, my blog is visupview.blogspot.com, V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W. Uh, Visup actually stands for Volusia, Volusia Investigative Society of Unexplained Phenomena. Uh, so, yeah, that was definitely quite a while ago. Of course, I'm, you know, now... Uh, you know, over 10 years later, I'm primarily known as a parapolitical researcher. I'm uh, the host of the Farm Podcast. I've uh, had a wide variety of guests on uh, over the last two years. Uh, Dan Walsh, Basolka, Christopher Knowles, Russ Baker, Dave Troy, Stephen Hassan. So, I mean, I kind of uh, mix it up a lot. I've always had this sort of dual interest in parapolitics and also uh, the paranormal. I've found generally, like over the years, frequently they're they're much more interrelated than um, people understand. Um, in fact, really, I uh, and then also too, you know, we maybe you get into like also like kind of magic and that other sort of woo woo stuff. Honestly, I had to ultimately kind of start doing like really serious studies on magic, sort of understand um, some of the developments that I was seeing and just some of the. Uh, you know, the deep political research that I do, because honestly, that's the only way you can make sense of some of this crap. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I try to always approach a lot of this stuff very, you know, when it comes to parapolitical research, very logically, you know, it's like, I don't want to be the person going around raving about like reptilians and what have you. Um, it's just that I've often found out that like the truth is actually far stranger than reptilians. It would almost be easier if it was simply reptilians. <laughs> But um, anyway, so, you know, I mean, how like a lot of this kind of stuff got intersected had to do with you know, a lot of experiences that uh, I've had throughout the course of my life. I think like the first really sort of pivotal moment for me that was kind of like a starting point uh, for all this was, uh, incidentally, the first time that I took mushrooms. Uh, so anyway, this uh, unfolded in, uh, it was like when I was in college, so around 2002, 2003. And I was living in Colorado Springs, uh, attending the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs at the time. It's probably not the best city to have your first psychedelic experience in. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously it's got the, the whole NORAD facility there. And I mean, all the air, and there's like an army and an air force base. There's a lot of yeah. GIs, but it's also like the, the headquarters for focus on the family. Uh, I mean, I don't know what it's like now. It's been years since I've been there, but I mean, God, when I was there, like, you know, in, you know, oh three or something like that, I mean, you would see people, um, you know, saying prayers over like their Big Macs at McDonald's before they ate kind of thing. I mean, it was, uh, it was strange. To put it <laughs> but, um, anyway, you know, I've managed to get some shrooms. I, that was actually the first time I tripped in general, uh, for a variety of reasons. I think I was like around 20 or something like that. A lot of my friends had already tripped like, earlier but anyway you know i decided to give it uh, the old college try uh <laughs> So anyway, I'm living on the dorms and what have you, took the mushrooms and everything was, you know, groovy. It was, I guess, you know, a pretty typical experience with some nice colors and what have you. The dorms had like their own like kind of cafeteria there and they had this, you know, cool feature where I think they would open up at about 11 at night and go to about 1230 and, the, you know, students could basically go in and get uh, a proverbial midnight snack or something. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, it was really cool, man. So anyway, um... I decided to head in there because it kind of seemed like the shrooms were starting to knock on, you know, wear off and I was starting to feel a little uh, peakish. So I figured I maybe would go grab some pancakes or something like that. So, you know, the cafeteria, I mean, it's, you know, basic cafeteria set up. It's you know, like a lot of them kind of white and what have you. So I uh, walk into it and the first thing that's off is it's like it seems like there's a smoke machine or something in there. I mean, the whole thing just looks like really cloudy to me. And then I'm like really starting to look around and I start to see the that there are these uh, these large gray aliens, like seven, eight feet tall, that are walking around like amongst the students. And they were incredibly lifelike. And subsequently since then, this, I've I've done quite a considerable amount of psychedelics. I mean, of course, I just ended up telling you guys about how I was rolling uh, last time Jason and I hung out. So, yeah, like, I, I have experience with this, and I've never had visuals like that since. Wow. Where I just, you know, openly saw something like that distinct and, you know, I mean, I'm a full-blown almost like entity there. Well, I mean, that's, you know, personally what I do think I was seeing. 
And yeah, I mean, they are just kind of like walking through, uh, you know, among the crowd of students uh, studying them. And everybody's kind of going about their business, you know, getting their fruit and their cereal and their pancakes. And yeah, there's these, you know, eight feet tall aliens just kind of walking around with a smoke machine and whatnot. So, yeah, and I mean, I was I remember there's also sort of the buzzing noise that I was hearing and all this other kind of stuff. But anyway, for obvious reasons that I probably don't need to spell out, it was uh, a pretty striking experience. Yeah, for sure. That really got me... Uh, interested in the topic uh specifically of um you know aliens as they related to psychedelic substances i had never really been that interested i mean i was an x-files fan and that kind of thing you know i mean i was a very big x-files fan and you know like a lot of people i mean i had at that point in time kind of assumed that the you know it seemed logical that there probably were extraterrestrials out there somewhere but i mean i certainly wasn't like fixated or anything like that on the subject i had never felt the need to like read a book or anything like that about aliens uh before that experience or yeah. you know, really look up anything online about them or anything so after that though i became really interested specifically in just you know the uh connections between aliens and psychedelics and if that was something other people had experienced and that had actually led me to um a lot of the stuff like on dmt i mean obviously you know there's the mechanical elves thing um but then i also became really interested in the um experiments that rick strassman had done that's uh, i think it was like the university of arizona or something like that uh during the 90s or maybe it was somewhere in new mexico it was like one of those southwestern locales and yeah, it was another thing that people who were uh, participating in these DMT experiences had reported frequently or seeing, you know, these aliens and whatnot, these gray aliens, which I thought was really fascinating, right? It's really fascinating. Uh, I actually have two questions before we go much further because I don't want to lose them. Sure, sure. The first question is, how were your pancakes that night? I don't think I ended up eating the pancakes. I think I just got like a cup of coffee or something. And then I sat down at the table and was just kind of like just watching everything <laughs> for I don't know how long. You kind of forget about stuff like pancakes. <laughs> uh, you know, when you see that kind of thing, man. Like, yeah. So the second question is a serious question. You mentioned that the grays that you saw were like seven or eight feet tall. How often do you come across that variation? Because the popular... The majority decisive statement is that they're like three to four feet tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That was one of the things I had noticed was that um, the ones that I, the beings that I had witnessed were definitely taller than what a lot of people normally report. But I, I want to say, though, I think the the um, um, the aliens that were seen in the Strassman experiments were also like a taller variety. I don't know if they were necessarily like abnormally tall, seven or eight feet tall, but I think they were at least like human size, you know, like five, six mm -hmm. feet tall. And I think it's something like that with the with McKenna's elves, but I'm. It's been a long time since I've looked at any of that kind of stuff, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> so I kind of wonder too, if possibly like with at least some of the beings. I mean, in that regard, on psychedelics, they maybe look taller. But I mean, flip side of the coin, I I've, I've talked to people who have seen you know like like gnomes and stuff like that, like kind of smaller like uh, critters, you know, kind of running around as well. I mean, I've never seen that myself. You know, I do think that. I mean, yeah, there is, you know, something to that uh, with sort of a kind of archetypical elemental beings. And I mean, certainly, you know, you had some that were uh, of like a larger stature and then the other ones that were sort of like these more miniature beings. And I mean, you know, again, I tend to go in more for sort of the Killian or Valayan, you know, uh, take on the ufo phenomenon that i mean it's related to you know a lot of the fairy lore and that kind of stuff oh, so for sure for sure i kind of think i mean again you know there's as you know you did have the reports of the beings that could be different sizes i mean from that kind of lore i mean i think it's kind of inevitable that you would see something similar like that with the ufos the reason i ask is because uh, i have a good friend who lives in utah his name's adam taula he was actually on the last episode co-hosted with me. And Adam has investigated the area surrounding the Skinwalker Ranch a lot. And he had an experience where he encountered a really tall gray alien. And it was the first time that I had come across somebody reporting seeing one that was, you know, massively 
tall. And so whenever you said that, I was like, that's really interesting because I know obviously yours was, you know, a direct influence of <laughs> being you know, on shrooms. He hadn't been. And so I wonder if there's some sort of, I don't know, like some sort of psychedelic resonance, you know, around Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> Now, there's a resonance around Skinwalker Ranch, all right, man, but I don't know if it's psychedelics. You got to continue that. You can't just stop there. Like, what? What are you? Uh, what are you sitting on? Oh, you. I mean, I've um, interviewed Erica Loops a couple of times. Of course, her ex. I mean, was a guard at Skinwalker Ranch, and um, well, I can't really. It's not the kind of thing I can really talk about publicly. Some of the other uh, conversations I've had with people about Skinwalker, but um, you could just simply say that. If you look through the CVs of a um, fair amount of the scientists that were attached to NIDS and then later, what was it, Bast or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they did some stuff also that sort of applied to, you know, psychotronic weapons and um, other type of related research, you know, theories about uh, whether, you know, there was a specific brainwave uh, that could be read, you know, with an EEG device, if it could be induced artificially, all that mm. other kind of stuff. I mean... You know, there's a lot of weird stuff about that. The area, not the ranch itself. That's one of the major things that's been, I think, kind of blown up. I mean, most of the prior owners have insisted that there really wasn't any kind of major paranormal experiences there until Bigelow had taken and uh, had gotten involved. Uh, but the area itself, you know, did have kind of a history of weird stuff happening there. So I think it's. A kind of experiment, uh, let's just say. All right. Yeah, we can roll with that. I've thought about that without any context. Like, I've kind of thought this, maybe this is all artificial or at least yeah. artificially induced. Well, I mean, again, you know, you got to kind of remember, I mean, a lot of these people sort of subscribe again also as we do to, you know, a lot of belays notions. And, um, well, if the phenomena is a kind of um, control system, well, I mean, and from a scientific perspective, there should be a way to theoretically activate this control system, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I like what you're putting down there. Anyway, I didn't mean to take us wildly off topic, but I thought it was interesting with the, uh, the spectacle of seven to eight foot tall gray aliens. Aliens. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, you know, and I mean, uh, you know, this all kind of ties in because I mean, uh, a big part of why I know this kind of stuff about Skinwalker Ranch is because I did have that bloody experience years ago. So nice. So uh, you have more experiences, right? This isn't the only thing that you've you no, personally no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. This was just sort of like my really kind of maiden voyage into like high strangeness, and the first time that I kind of not just necessarily realized the reality of the paranormal, but I mean also how like a lot of this stuff, you know, sort of like intersected things like psychedelics and UFO experiences and all kinds of other strange things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Another thing about this, too, is eventually, so I'm kind of thinking about this, like, okay, so I saw um, these gray aliens under an altered state of consciousness. Well, uh, okay, other people have seen them, you know, with uh, other kinds of psychedelic drugs, but what about other types of altered states uh, that aren't necessarily induced by psychedelics? And I started looking around, um, you know, and then I had noticed a lot of the SRI remote viewing experiments, and it turned out that uh, throughout a lot of these programs, and then later, like the military ones, Stargate and so forth. You know, that was another common thing, is a lot of these remote viewers were also seeing these uh, gray aliens and stuff like that, or just in general encountering uh, alien beings and a lot of these uh, you know, kind of astral projection type things that they were doing, right? Yeah. So it was another interesting thing. And then, you know, kind of also on a, a darker side to it, too, a lot of people who were, like, involved in this started to have, like, health problems. Uh, in the case of the Strassman, you know, experiments, uh, several of the people who were doing the DMT experiments had developed cancer suddenly. And uh, it was a similar thing with the remote viewers. Quite a few of them uh, had also developed a cancer rather sudden, uh, rather suddenly and at fairly young ages and had succumbed to it. So that was sort of like another weird thing. Didn't Terrence McKenna but, die from cancer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrence McKenna died from cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, an, um, you know, another sort of uh, strange and kind of sinister aspect about this. It doesn't yeah. Seem like something you're close to this type of thing uh, for extended periods of time there can be very real physical fallout from it what do you think that is 
I'm hesitant because this gets into some maybe more personal experiences that I've had that I don't really feel comfortable talking about. Let's just say some of this stuff needs to feed that you encounter over there. A lot of this stuff is hungry, man. Some things can start to notice you after a while that uh, aren't very nice. And maybe sometimes certain people want them to notice you too, but that's another topic. Yeah, yeah. We're getting we're getting really dark. All right. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was... Uh, but one of the reasons why I was kind of getting into that a bit is that was uh, actually one of the reasons why, I, you know, it ultimately kind of going into some of the stuff with uh, the research into, like, op things like Project Artichoke and MKUltra. Uh, because, again, you know, you inevitably, you know, kind of look into the SRI stuff and uh, you sort of see that a lot of it was an outgrowth of some of the stuff that uh, Intrigue of Pure Heart was doing and later stuff that was kind of tied into these things with Artichoke and MKUltra. And, you know, you kind of start to wonder about that kind of stuff and why was it being done. Um, so I think in a lot of ways that's one of the reasons why I have maybe a more novel approach to parapolitical research than a lot of people because I actually did kind of get into it, you know, from this sort of woo-woo angle and then kind of gradually uh, developed more of an academic approach. But my sort of foundation stone was always this sort of curiosity that, you know, derived my own kind of psychedelic experiences and then later, uh, you know, kind of my involvement with the uh, synchro mystical community. I mean, you know, Chris Knowles and the Secret Sun would be sort of like the other foundation stone for a lot of what I do as well. So there's always been that kind of prism. But anyway, uh, you know, we were going to talk some paranormal stuff. All right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. anyway, getting back on topic. All right. So when I first started to get into this kind of thing, you know, and it was... I think I was 28 years old when I really kind of actively started getting sinker mysticism and whatnot. It was, um, you know, definitely a point where I was really trying to change my life up. And so I decided I was going to become, or I was going to start dabbling in ghost hunting. I went out with a couple of these uh, groups in Florida, which is where I was living at the time. Uh, they were basically a joke. I mean, typical, you know, taps kind of stuff. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound condescending, but I mean, even back then, I tended to have like more of a, a broader interest in this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I had a lot of theories about, you know, whether or not some of the stuff that you were talking to were actually the spirits of the dead or whether there's something else, you know, could you trick them? You know, I wanted to kind of experiment and play around with a lot of this stuff. And these people are just kind of like, ooh, you know, we could maybe get a voice to record or something. I mean, not to say that there's not value in that. But I was like, you know, there's a lot more we could be doing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, start to see like what this crap really is what you could do with it you know i mean even sort of before i knew about like you know attempts to deliberately create hauntings and stuff like that like the sword experiments and but yeah so anyway i ended up doing uh, my own thing with one of my buddies uh chris in the local area i was in daytona we were living around the daytona beach area blessedly there is a kind of quasi window area nearby it's uh called casadega uh have you ever heard of that yeah yeah. Okay, yeah, cool, cool. All right, so for the listeners who are not familiar with that, Casadega was founded around the uh, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. It was set up by the spiritualist church, and supposedly they followed a spirit guide. They were based out of New York State. I suppose they followed a spirit guide down to this spot in Florida, which is, you know, especially back then, God, I mean, it would have been just basically in the middle of swamp yeah and I mean, daytona beach was like probably 20 miles away orlando was like another 40 or something i mean it was like nothing uh they set this place up um and to this day it's basically nothing but like fortune tellers and stuff like that that live there it's just it's like sort of weird little new age community in the middle of nowhere there's a lot of just odd things about it like the landscape it actually has like some hills and it's and i know that you know Obviously, to a lot of people, you're like, why the fuck would that be significant? And I would say it, it's Florida, okay? Mm -hmm. There are no hills in Florida. You know, it's it's flat, man. And it's just like Casadega, you're actually going up and down like a lot of these hills. And there's this one particular hill, multiple people I had talked to had experienced this. I mean, it feels like something literally will grab your car and pull you going like up it. You know what I'm saying? You're That's going weird. Up it. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing, bro. And it's actually like kind of right as you're getting into the town, too. I almost had always kind of wondered if it was some kind of like 
guardian thing or something that had been set up. And obviously there is the uh, the graveyard there with the god's chair and the devil's chair. Uh, I, you know, grew up as a metalhead. You know, we used to go up there at night all the time and, you know, do booze and start, get drunk, get high, you know, party in the god's chair and the devil's chair. It was good times. The graveyard is just insane. I mean, with some of the architecture in there, there's a lot of these uh, headstones, a lot of these um, Masonic symbolism. There's like a bunch of owls, a lot of other kind of occulty stuff. It's a really crazy looking spot, to put it mildly. But yeah, the really big thing though is the park, which nobody ever really talks about either, which is funny because that's like where all the really weird shit happens. So anyway, like the original hotel was built out of this park, right? And it burned down in the 1920s. And there's honestly not like a ton of information around about that either. I've always kind of wondered what the circumstances were to that. Uh, but there's like a lot of these weird ruins like throughout the park, Lake Colby Park, uh, that are left over from the hotel. And it's a really, really big park, too. I mean, all around this lake, obviously, and you can, like, wander around it. And, I mean, just, you know, from the beginning when I would start going out there initially, you know, for, like, hikes and stuff, it's really quite scenic as well. But, I mean, like I said, there's all these sort of weird random ruins. But, I mean, you would see just these weird ass like tracks and stuff and you know you would sometimes get like the feeling like stuff was watching you and just all kinds of weird stuff like that uh when i started doing you know like the paranormal investigations that was like high on my list of like you know let's you know because i'd heard a lot of people had experiences there just all kinds of crazy shit uh so i was like let's go check it out and see like what'll happen right now of course you can't actually camp there so uh we had to sneak in uh, on the you know, basically had one of our buddies drop us off, like, the gear in front of the park, right, as it was closing. We locked in there and set up deep within the uh, park uh, where, you know, we could do a fire and it wouldn't be visible from anywhere. You know, finally, at about midnight, we decided it was a good time now to really start doing the investigation. So, I had always thought the area around the hotel was really interesting. Um, or the ruins of the hotel, I should say, not the actual hotel tell it's still there especially since there's this sort of grove there you know it's like this bamboo that's like all sort of centered around would have been like i guess the front of the place we had set up camp i want to say maybe a mile or something from there it was a bit of a distance so we were like making our way to the spot i mean it just seemed like something was like following us and then as we got into this grove right you know we're looking off in the distance and we start seeing stuff like the tops of the trees are like moving and you can see like from branch to branch like something's almost like walking or jumping you know i mean each treetop is like moving and like it's coming towards us right and then suddenly it starts picking up speed and it's almost like something's been shot from a cannon coming through like the trees right at us right the guys i was with they start running away i was like the one who stood there uh, pat and uh one of my buddies had the uh, the foresight to turn around and film some of this and anyway like when i experienced it i could just feel like this tremendous force like this breeze come down and then it like stopped and pulled up like right in front of my face and when we went back and looked at the video it was like an orb basically that you could see coming through like the trees and coming down and then it like swooped up like in front of my face right wow so yeah yeah it was like pretty nuts man so anyway, that was my Casadega experience. It's a crazy place. Um, I always like to point this out because not a lot of people know that. And pretty much anything where you find like a Lovecraft connection, there's going to be some weird shit, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. A really dark Lovecraft connection to this. Okay, so nearby Casadega, it's the closest town, a place called Delenn. Deland actually had a lovely Masonic Lodge, too, that I uh, had the pleasure of visiting at one point. Saw uh, that was quite active in the 20s. Lovecraft used to go visit Delend, Florida, uh, from time to time. There was that one kid who was like his huge fan and then became, um, the executioner of Lovecraft's literary estate after he shed his mortal coil. <clears throat> and yes, it was odd. Um, the kid, the, you know, the kid was a minor throughout this whole time frame that he was corresponding with Lovecraft and Lovecraft would travel, you know, from, like, New England area down to Florida at a time when 
travel, you know, wasn't exactly easy or cheap. You know, there was like the 20s and 30s we're talking about. Florida sure. wasn't like we're near the kind of like vacation destination it is now, right? He would go down to visit this kid who was like a freaking minor, a teenager. Uh, the kid's parents built a shed outside the house for Lovecraft to stay in with the kid where they would stay up deep into the night and discuss literature together. Right. That's not creepy so, at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. So anyway, Lovecraft was also nearby this spot, the one God knows what with this kid. So wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of weird stuff about that whole area. That was definitely when I kind of became convinced that the whole Windows th- area thing uh, was very much real. You know, I know I've spoken to a lot of other people who had experiences in Casadega as well. And just, you know, I had my own little experience there and just kind of the odd vibe. But again, you know, it's the park, right? I mean, I think it's probably partly because there's a lot of occult groups that do shit out there, too. I mean, I used to know some of the local Satanists. I was metalhead, you know, so of course I knew a couple of the Satanists in my area and they would occasionally go out there and do rituals. But I didn't know back then what I know now about occult stuff. So I'm sure there's probably a lot of other groups that were active. But I mean, certainly there was like a lot of magical workings that were done at the park back then. I mean, I'm guessing it probably never really stopped. I don't know. Yeah, probably not. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, obviously there is some level of success, right? So, like, anytime that anyone in practice has some level of success, they don't just like, ah, it's fine, we're done. Like, I'm sure it's still definitely going on. And again, I mean, it's it's, it's kind of dig, man. I mean, that's pretty much like what it's all about. I mean, yeah, during the day, it's like that kind of sanctized, you know, sanitized Shirley MacLaine <laughs> new age stuff. I mean, the old ladies go down to the the actual hotel where I mean, I'm guessing rooms are probably like $500 a night now and they have like the fucking fortune teller which they're just show, you know, show people. I mean, they rip you off and what have you and mm-hmm. you buy the, the stuff at the gift store that costs seven times what it should and I mean, there's that whole aspect of it. Outside of that kind of stuff i mean yeah when you get into some of the alpha beaten path stuff there, like park i mean there is uh there's definitely some real power there and i mean yeah i mean i don't think people are ever going to start uh, tapping into that certainly it sounds a lot like mount shasta <clears throat> oh yeah yeah you know and that was kind of one of the things about my um life you know it was like kind of interesting in hindsight uh, that I kind of grew up like in that, you know, kind of milieu around there. I mean, I suppose kind of giving some of the things that I got involved with like later on in my life. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I kind of had that uh, that strange sort of presence there with Casadega because I was always really fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was uh, one of my experiences with the paranormal. Um, and then obviously I had a couple of other ones too uh, in that kind of area around there. Uh, in the old ghost hunting days, uh, <laughs> you know, and that was like when I kind of definitely became convinced that you know there were things that you could communicate with. But uh, I'm always sort of on the fence when you get into spirits of the dead, though. I do. Think there's a lot of uh, manipulation that goes on. A lot of people get uh, toyed with, uh, to put it mildly, with that kind of stuff. No, I get that. I'm I'm always bothered by the fact that everyone believes like the cemetery is full of the spirits of the dead. Like if you were if, let's just we're just going to spitball here. If you were the spirit of someone who had physically passed away on this planet and they're buried in a hole, like are you going to want to like just hang out there even if you have no interest in uncovering secrets of the physical world or you know traveling to see things like in the spirit world like you still wouldn't want to just hang out just around your body right why would why would a cemetery be full of ghosts why is every cemetery supposedly haunted it's just that that fear of the unknown that people have they put so much energy into these places being haunted just because they don't understand or or they're afraid and i think maybe a lot of that energy you know manifests in different ways and manifests actual you know, activity that people think they're talking to the spirits of the dead. And really, they're just talking to this manifestation of all this collective energy, an egregore almost. Yeah, yeah. No, and I mean, I think that's, you know, the thing. I mean, I don't think people really realize how our consciousness, I mean, you know, intersects uh, 
with reality itself in a lot of ways. I mean, I do think, you know, there's a lot of merit to some of the co-creation hypotheses out there that, I mean, essentially that, you know, we do construct our own reality. And I mean, I, you know, I think we're actually kind of really starting to see that now with, I mean, effectively the proverbial breakdown of consensus reality that's, you yeah. know, kind of ongoing in front of our very eyes. And I mean, I think that that potentially contributes to a lot of the, the stuff like the Mandela effect. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like, okay, so I'll just say like another thing thing too is like i've always uh had really interesting stuff with uh sleep right i've almost always been able to lucid dream even since i was very young well before i had like any idea that there was like such a thing you know i kind of like thought that like everybody always knew when they were dreaming I yeah they were able to like do stuff in it but i guess apparently it's like something that you have to like train yourself in a lot i've had certain like very specific like reoccurring dreams as well that are uh, quite interesting i've also you know had some prophetic dreams like i uh, had a dream of my father shortly before he passed away at the time he was really you know ravaged with dementia he couldn't uh, you know really hold a conversation or anything but i was able to have like a very clear distinct conversation you know with him where he was able to like say goodbye to me just you know some stuff like that but um the thing that's interesting though is i don't really hardly ever remember my dreams uh and i i've actually come to realize i think that's because i go into like what is known as the uh the deep sleep and this sort of goes into like occultism right okay so there's like three uh, stages of consciousness. Okay, so there's uh, waking consciousness, you know, obviously the state that we're in, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. There's your dream consciousness, which is what you exist in when you're dreaming. And then there's the deep sleep, which is like the void or the blackness. <laughs> but almost, like, do you go to a state beyond that? And of course, you know, this is a big stuff part of like a lot of like magical workings is to try to go into the deep sleep and even beyond the deep sleep like in uh your like waking life right mm -hmm. um but i will tell you though i definitely am a big believer in this kind of stuff because uh throughout my entire life i have woken up periodically with scratches on my body at parts that i could not reach like usually it's at the my, my back and like really weird angles and it's always three marks always 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 three marks what are your what are your thoughts on that where how do you how do you sit on that <laughs> oh i was told i was blessed by a couple of magicians <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit skeptical on that point, though, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, man. Uh, I've had a lot of, in my whole entire life, really, I have these incredibly vivid dreams. And nine and a half times out of ten, they are just ridiculous and funny and, and fun. Last night, I, in fact, or this morning, I was hit by a semi-driver uh, who was slowing down to stop at a stop sign. And uh, I moved like tar and... Really, he just kind of touched me with his front bumper, and then he gave me a ride two blocks to my grade school so I could meet Macaulay Culkin as I was throwing pallet boards into a into a dumpster. You know, so it's stuff like that all the time. I've had incredibly. Yeah, I, wish I had normal dreams. <laughs> <laughs> like it's either nothing or it's it's something that's like yeah, usually like loaded with weird symbolism. God, I, there's actually been times where I think I was actually under some kind of attack when I was dreaming. I'm, like, not even kidding, man. Yeah. It was insane. Like, yeah, like, dream about Macaulay Culkin or, like, girls or something like that. Unfortunately, I don't even get that. Like, yeah, I, so. I get that all the time. You know, but you I have... how lucky you are, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I have occasionally... I will have a lucid dream, and and I've talked about them on the show. The last one I had was a couple of years ago, and uh, my friend John and I were abducted by aliens. Uh, and they put us in this three-dimensional cubic purple grid work. And each of the cubes, oh, really? there would be something that was uh, totally like mundane, like a potted plant or a desk or a picture hanging on a non-existent wall. Uh, and there was this current of, of air that would go through these different cubes, and you could ride the current into another cube and it seemed like it had a random order but you know, when you're only observing something that you have no comprehension of who knows if it was random or not and when i was there i was convinced this was really happening and i, I was worried about 
my family and my friends and not being able to tell them where I went and where I, where I'd gone, why, and that I'd never be back. Like you could not have convinced me otherwise that it wasn't really happening. And I had full control over my actions, over my thoughts. So when I woke up, I was definitely surprised that I was dreaming. So I have, I have incredibly lucid dreams on occasion and I've never tried to lucid dream. Whenever I was in my early twenties, lucid dreams were my gateway to astral projection. I would say the majority of the astral projection experiences I've had were through lucid dreams. So like, oh, I'm dreaming. Well, check this out. You know, like I'll, I'll shuck another layer off the onion, right? So I, I do have several astral projection uh, experiences under my belt and I cannot do that anymore. I completely shut down astral projection for like the last probably 10 years. If I consciously try to do it, nothing. If I do find myself lucid dreaming, it's not even a thought anymore. Like I could go do this. So it's weird because I definitely had made a lot of progress in it. And now it's just like a non-existent tool for me. Yeah. And I mean, it's like sometimes, I mean, you know, I see, I used to actually be able to go into like full blown trance like states to, because that's like the kind of the thing. I think I was actually always able to go into some of these different stages of consciousness when I was like younger naturally. I mean, I haven't been able to do that, I think, since I was like a teenager or something like that. Yeah, it, you know, I can definitely see what you're saying. It's just sort of like sometimes you have like a certain ability for those kinds of things and then just kind of inexplicably you don't. In hindsight, I'm probably glad that I can't do that now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like at the point where like I... I've been through so much weird crap over the course of my life. I'm almost like, I mean, oh yeah, I've seen a UFO too. When I saw God, when I saw a UFO, like, I think it was like two years ago or something. I mean, I was, I went outside my cabin and looked up and I mean, it was like, wow, that's uh that plane really seems like it's moving like really slow. And then it just started suddenly spinning around and all these like weird angles. And then it just blinked like out of existence suddenly before my eyes. I was just kind of like, whatever, man, fuck it. <laughs> I've seen a UFO, big deal. Everybody's like, all like, it make any so UFO. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think at the po that point in time, there's so much other weird stuff happening to me. I was just kind of like, dude, th this is nothing. I mean, I can't believe people spend their entire lives hoping that they see this crap. This is a joke. Do you like? Obviously, this is this is a good a good example of how I feel about this. I've seen three, and if I am not talking about UFOs, it doesn't even register. In my memory, I've never dwelled on it. I, I if after yeah, each no, one, like, I seen that was like, like kind of why I ended up going into the dream stuff there because I was like, you know, I had some other kind of weird experience I was going to close out with because I had my psychedelic experience and I had my paranormal one, and then I was like, I know I had another kind of one, and it was just now as we were leaving, I was like, oh yeah, I saw a UFO. So yeah, it's it's like that. It's like you know, I could go into just. I mean, honestly, I mean, I didn't even really get into, like, some of the synchronicity, synchronicity stuff. But, I mean, you know, frankly, I think a lot of that stuff is a lot more incredible, honestly, than just, like, things like UFOs and what have you. You know, especially, like, I mean, just with me, like, the last two years, I mean, you know, we were kind of, like, talking about how, like, uh, meeting people, and yeah, it has been. But, I mean, for me, at least, it's also just been kind of mind-blowing how i've met some of these people i mean just you know to give you an example like in the case of uh nathan right so i saw hellier uh season two and i was immediately drawn to nathan because i really thought he had like a, a fascinating perspective especially like in the stuff of somerset that was in line with my own so i had searched on um around to try to see if i could find some contact information for him found him on facebook and i sent him this message this long message you know basically went on about how cool i thought he had sounded on uh, hellier and you know really i wanted to talk to him about some of my theories i had and i didn't hear anything back you know, for like three or four weeks or something like that. And then kind of like out of the blue, I got an email from Nathan and he was asking, I should say when I, I sent him a message on Facebook, this was like right when I first got the farm going and I wanted to uh, interview him for the farm too. So that was also what I'd asked. And um, so I got an email from Nathan and he told me that he had been reading my blog, Visa, for a while now, and he was a really big fan. He wanted to interview me for Penny Royal. 
So I was like, well, fuck, man. Like, that's insane. You know, I was like, dude, I had just actually asked you a couple of weeks ago for an interview for my podcast. So on Facebook, right? So yeah, it was kind of just like that sort of weird thing where like, even before, you know, we had even spoken to each other, we had been kind of simultaneously like drawn to one another yeah. and the work that we were doing. And then it was just kind of the whole thing with the, you know, the backgrounds that we had, uh, respectively. Cause it's like, uh, uh, Darren and Nathan are both, uh, special school kids as am i and uh incidentally that's also the case with like a lot of uh <laughs> a lot of people i've found who are involved in uh, this kind of stuff we all seem to have been uh gifted kids got chances to go to special schools yeah i guess they really are a thing yeah you know they all three all three of you uh your intelligence is oftentimes intimidating i was a little stressed about having you on the show i'm not gonna lie just because i know that there's so much information in your head it's it is it's overwhelming for me and i can't imagine living with all that information it's just like talking to nathan is like plugging a computer into the wall that you can't shut off and it's just constantly going and constantly giving you all this output all this output all this output how can you function as a human being and do regular person things when you're just constantly overwhelmed with all of this stuff just eating away at you i don't know i mean it's just i it guess when it's like you know it's kind of like the norm for you i mean you know you just kind of go with it right yeah but, um but I mean, yeah, it's just, you know, that's honestly, you know, to some extent, the kind of stuff that blows my mind more because I mean, it was also like, you know, when I encountered Nathan, I mean, it was at a specific point in my life where I think, you know, I really needed to encounter him, you know, and also I mean, to help them with the stuff that they were doing and to help, you know, so they could help me with the stuff that I was doing. So, I mean, it was almost like, you know, in a sense, it was almost like fate that we were brought together because we had, you know, information that each other needed and we were going to be able to help each other grow in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Yeah. And, you know, that's happened to me with a lot of people, honestly, like in the last two years. Uh, so. You know, and that's, like I said, I kind of find, like, where synchronicities and stuff in a lot of ways are, at least for me personally, I mean, a lot more amazing, you know, seeing a UFO or something. Because, I mean, it's like also, you know, you're kind of, in some cases, I mean, helping a person's journey and, I mean, seeing them yeah. grow, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It is. Talking to people, meeting people, and getting all these these fascinating stories that I can't get otherwise in my life right now. You know what I mean? There's no one, mm -hmm. no one where I live is into this shit <laughs> except for me. Yeah, so. no, I know exactly what you're saying. Like I said, that's why, I mean, I'm so happy that I was able to finally like make a little money off this stuff. So now I can like travel and hang out with like a lot of you guys. Uh, you know, that's really been the best part about all of this. Yeah, for sure. I look forward to uh, the next time we run into each other in the wild. I didn't know that you were even going to be in Somerset. So it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted, man, uh, when I'm uh, heading back there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, let me uh, know, too, when you're planning on going back. I mean, I'll kind of see if I can maybe swing something. Yeah, that'd be great. I don't have any concrete plans right now. Uh, I do want to try to get to Utah this year at some point, but I don't know if that will happen or not. Um, well, yeah, no, I mean, I, like I said, I'm going to Utah in March, and I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. My best friend in the entire world lives uh, in Utah. So, you know, I mean, I probably will be going back, I would say, at least again at some point in the summer fall to hang out with yeah. them. So yeah well utah i mean it's there's a lot of weird shit in utah oh man. i know it uh, really is a trip it really is well steven where can people find the farm and your blog and everything take a few minutes talk about yourself mm. promote yourself the fun stuff okay okay so you can find uh, my blog at visitu.blogspot.com that's v-i-s-u-p-v-i-e-w.l dot blogspot.com and buys a view is all one word so there yeah, that was kind of my uh start and then i also am the host of the farm podcast which you can find at the farm podcast all one word dot com and i am also the author of strange tales of the parapolitical post war nazis mercenaries and other secret history as well as a special relationship trump epstein and the secret history of the anglo-american establishment but we'll get those out there and then hopefully my forthcoming book will be out uh by may i've been working with this bloody thing for over a year now it's uh god it's like i think close to two hundred thousand words it's going to be something else when it's finished i'll tell wow. you that wow that is the book you keep in the house 
to read and when you're done to kill the occasional insect just to throw it out yeah no like it's gonna be like yeah it's gonna be like probably a thousand pages or something <laughs> congratulations man that's awesome good job mm-hmm. thanks so uh everyone listening I hope you've enjoyed the episode. I've definitely enjoyed the conversation. Steven Snyder, thank you so much for stopping in to the paranormal patio to share some of your information and some of your stories. Hopefully, we'll have you on again in the future and we can talk more of your parapolitical stuff too. And maybe we'll branch out here. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I have to come. Yeah. Next time you bring me back on, man, I'll tell you about Saturn Eye Magic. That's a really fun topic too. That's what I was going to talk about tonight, but I don't know. I think the paranormal discussion is kind of fun. I don't get to talk about this stuff a lot. So, yeah, it's always fun, man. I love it. Until next time, keep the fire going.